So we will um, be getting started with our second and last panel of the evening. And I just want to, again, thank everyone for showing up. The weather is not so nice outside, so thank you for, for being here. And also, just um, as someone who moved here in 2005 and thinking about trying to get my footing here in Black Boston, I just want to say thank you for... Um, I know Cali is gone, but uh, I know Basic Black was part of that footing for me, and the banner was definitely um, um, helped me ease my transition. Because I think for a lot of Black folks, the transition to Boston can be a little bumpy, and I know Black um, Basic Black and the banner were definitely helpful for me in making that transition. Um, and also, as far as thank you goes, people who know me know I do this pretty much every time I speak in front of an audience. But I also want to thank um, everyone who helped prepare this room, um, for all the food service, people, everyone who cleans the room. I come from a long line of people who clean rooms like this. I would not be here if it wasn't for those long line of people to clean rooms like this. And I always carry those people with me when I come into spaces like this. I would not be here without for those ancestors who worked really hard for me to be here to speak to you all. So I want to thank the ancestors as well. Um, so let's get started. Our um, session today is community journalism and social media activism. And for our first panelist, we have Jamal Crawford, who is the publisher and editor of um, Blackstonian, the Black Boston 411. Crawford was born and raised in an artistic family in the Roxbury neighborhood of Boston and attended Elma Lewis School of Fine Arts, where he began writing poetry and rhyming. Over the past two decades, Crawford has featured hundreds of poetry and hip hop shows and performed with and open for the last, the last Poets, Poor Righteous Teachers, Amir Baraka, and three of my personal favorites, Public Enemy, Dead Prez, and Sonia Sanchez. He is the recipient of several city council resolutions from Boston and Cambridge, has organized numerous town hall forums, film screenings, and events. Crawford has been active on issues of mass incarceration and police killings of civilians. He also led the effort to introduce the issue of police um, decertification to the state of Massachusetts. And last, Crawford is the author of two books, Prophecy, Reflections of, on Life and Love from a Black Perspective, 1996, and Prophecy, Exemption, and Redemption from 2008. And our second panelist is Martin Henson. Uh, he's an activist organizer and mental health counselor from Little Rock, Arkansas, a little southerner. Um, Henson's interests include alternative community structures, dismantling white supremacy, intersectional dialogue, and coalition building. Henson puts his interests to good use as an organizer for Black Lives Matter in Boston. He also does the BLM online radio show every Thursday from 7 to 8 30 p.m. streaming um, streaming live on uh, Insight Radio and YouTube. Martin Henson also represents BLM with the Deep, Deeper Than Water Coalition, an abolitionist coalition working against incarceration and water injustice while demanding the immediate provision of clean, safe water to prisoners. He regularly speaks to various groups about the importance of BLM's presence in the narrative of America's history and current political climate. So those are our speakers, and we, I will turn it over to you all. Uh, good evening, or good afternoon. Thank everybody for coming. Um, I think that this, this topic of uh, blacks in media in Boston is uh, critical as it is around the country, but Boston in particular. Um, I, I'll speak a little bit about the history and significance of, of Boston. But uh, many of you may know from the film Malcolm X, uh, where they say this is where Plymouth Rock landed on us, right? So we about a 45 minute drive from what I would submit is the epicenter of racism, white supremacy, the, the, the foundations of uh, colonialism, genocide, in this country. So we are in the original 13 colonies and all that. And what, did that, what does that mean? So sometimes, too, when people are, uh, you know, the question has been posed, you know, is Boston racist? You know, the only answer to that should be, duh. <laughs> right? 
So, um, and so now, now that we've done the whole, you know, Plymouth Rock, you got Plymouth Rock, you got Little Rock, right? <laughs> and both of these places on different sides of, of, of the country are uh, experiencing much of the same thing because white supremacy is like, uh, you know, it, it, it's like, let's say, the Coca-Cola Corporation. You don't like Coca-Cola? It's okay, we make Sprite. You don't like Sprite? We got Fanta. Oh, you don't like Orange Fanta? We got Grape. <laughs> We're gonna get your dollar somehow, right? We're gonna get your dollar somehow. So in white supremacy, it's like that old cookie commercial, bet you buy the chip, right? So wherever you go in this country, whatever you're dealing with, whether it's journalism, whether it's an institution of higher learning, whether it's the corporate world, wherever it is, you're gonna find some racism and some white supremacy, because that's what we're dealing with. So how does that relate to media in Boston? Well, first of all, when we're talking about media, you know, uh, you look at it, one of the people, uh, from only one of the two actually black-owned entities uh, that were there. And that's the Boston Banner, or the Bay State Banner, and WYLD, the radio station, right? In terms of people who actually purchased a thing, uh, a radio station, or made a business that is viable. Sometimes people like to compare me uh, to the banner, and I think it's a super unfair comparison, right? Because I am not a real newspaper. I'm just a guy, right? I don't have a staff. The Blackstonian itself is not a business. I view it more as a service. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a program, if you will. It was developed. I'll tell you how it came to be. 2002, I was the uh, Boston chapter chairman of the New Black Panther Party, and the New Black Panther Party, like many revolutionary organizations, had determined that when you are starting a new chapter in a new city or what have you, one of the best means to reach that population is via some form of communication, a newspaper. Uh, and so every chapter, part of what you were supposed to do is start a local newspaper. So here in Boston, I didn't want to call it, you know, the new Black Panther Times because people up here are scary as hell. So um, I wanted something that would be able to capture the essence of what I was trying to convey and really not scare people. And I'm not talking about white people, I'm talking about our own people, black people, who get scared. You know, uh, the last poets have a very famous poem talking about people are scared of revolution. Uh, so I, I wanted to be able to capture a, 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 wide, a wide breath. So I figured, hey, you know, I'm, I'm black, I'm a Bostonian, black, Stone black, 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 bust, smush, black stone. And um, there were people in other places uh, that I know. One of my good friends, he's down in Jacksonville. He has established Blacksonville. Um, uh, a, a young lady uh, who I know, sister works, uh, lives in uh, Muskegon, uh, Michigan. And one time she was working on Black Uh So there are these ways to inject, but now, once again, I'm not, a, I'm not a real newspaper, right? I view the media, communications, newspaper, newsprint, <coughs> websites, all as tools to the ultimate goal, which is the movement of our people for consciousness, awareness, social justice, racial justice, and end to global white supremacy. That's where I'm at with it. I'm part of the movement. And I just use this thing, right, as a tool, like any other. Um, I have no particular allegiance to it. I have no affinity for it. It is a tool, it is useful, so therefore I use it. When it ceases to become useful, I will discard it and find another <laughs> because the tree gotta get cut, so I have to find an ax. So for me, we, we uh, came up with a term called journ activism because I got tired of being uh, told that I had to adhere to some, well, you're a journalist, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. No, I'm not. I'm a guy from Humboldt Avenue, right? I'm not beholding to some sort of, not a doctor. I didn't take a, you know what I mean? Uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, the the, the Imhotep oath the doctors take? <laughs> some of y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Um, and, and, you know, if you're a lawyer and you take the bar and whatnot, and now you're beholden to the, the you know, um, in journalism, I'm not aware of some sort of, you know, thing. Uh, and certainly being that I'm not a graduate of a school of journalism, I'm not employed by a mainstream journalist entity, I enjoy 
the freedom of a free black man. And I can do and say whatever I want. Now, I'm beholden to my own set of principles, which is I'm trying to make sure that the information that I give out is accurate, right? Um, trying to make sure that the stuff is on point and well researched. And then also, too, being open that you are fallible so that, so that if something you are shown is incorrect, don't be afraid to correct it. And you should be first before somebody else. Jamal was wrong, Jamal was wrong. If it's shown, Jamal will report that Jamal was wrong, right? Those are the only um, standards that I hold to. Um, a couple of things, uh, Callie, Ms. Callie Crossley uh, spoke about uh, Boston for people from down south being referred to as up south. <coughs> Malcolm X said, anytime you south the Canada, you down south, right? Uh, many of us here, we call Boston, Massachusetts. We call it Boss Town, Massachusetts, right? Once again, back to the point, the original 13 colonies, you know, Boston likes to consider itself so academic, so cerebral. But I think that what you'll find here is a lot of the uh, kind of very Neanderthal and caveman type of thought processes as evidence with what you hear up here, you know, don't read the comment section. Don't read the comment section. Because what it does is it settles arguments for me a lot of time. Because the well-meaning uh, white people that I know, they don't believe that this other set of white people exists. Right? And it's important to document. No, no, it's 2018. I, I just got called a chimp today, by the way. I got called a chimp today on the comments from my YouTube video. Uh, a video in which the police forcefully entered my home illegally. And I'm just there, excuse me, sir, can you please leave me alone? You know, conducting myself as a normal citizen. And in the comments there, uh, oh, I'm assuming it was a white gentleman, suggested you should have put a bullet behind that chimp's ear. So this is, you know, what we're dealing with here. And that is a form of, the only reason I put it out there is to use that media and that tool of communication to show a larger thing because we're in the struggle right now of trying to push for police reform. So we use this tool to, to, to bolster our claim, to provide evidence, and in so doing, to put that message out there, it's dangerous, you know? Um, now luckily for me, I got thick skin, you know, I'm not, uh, him calling me a chimp is nothing, but it's indicative of a mindset that still exists in 2018. And unfortunately, it's not just some lowbrow people. They, 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 some of these people are doctors, lawyers, some of them are, you know, uh, academics, and, uh, professional people, corporate world, so on and so forth. So we need to get out of the, the stereotypical thing that, that, that these people are like knuckle dragging, you know, uh, few teeth missing, living in, in, in some trailer park somewhere. No, no, no. Racism is much more pervasive than that. And, and one of the functions of black media is to uh, combat that. And when issues come forth, to be able to analyze these issues and present information uh, and, and also resources too for, for other people to do uh, their own their own research. Blacks in media to me is about a couple of things, and I'm gonna use that word, you know, likes it's the frivolous. Um, but blacks in media is a couple of things. It's those who produce it, meaning all the people who choose to actually produce media, those who consume it, and then us as the subject of it, um, which was spoken about. Now, Miss Sarah and Shaw will remember this because there was a time. Uh, I want to say it was in the, in the 90s. Uh, the media was having a particular field day with the violence in the community, and they began using a bunch of code words and buzzwords that many people are quite familiar with. You know, uh, the jungle, right? Roxbury was the jungle. Ooh, ah, you know, the, the deep, dark jungle. Be careful. And it was, it was written about in a way to really uh, communicate a sense of dread, right? Don't go over there. You've ever seen that thing in the, in the Lion King when he says, you know, all of this is our kingdom, but don't go over there. You know, it's one of those type of deals where the Globe and the Herald have both equally painted Boston in, in, in a negative light. Um, to the part of, of, of this meeting that, that, that Ms. Shaw convened to bring uh, the heads of media, it was take radio, television, and news put there uh, at the Christmas Addicts up on Humboldt Avenue. Um, to begin to have this conversation and this dialogue that says you cannot refer to young black men 
as animals. You cannot refer to a community as a jungle. And there was a bunch of other little cold words and all this type of stuff that they threw in, much of it which was done by Mike Barnacle. Uh, and uh, Mike Barnacle at the time, I wrote a piece on it uh, called The Two-Headed Beast of Boston Journalism. Uh, and uh, talking about Mike Barnacle and Patricia Smith. One thing about Mike Barnacle that was not mentioned too, he was very prominent on television as well, uh, on Chronicle. And you know, he was a uh, part of this, uh, you know, this good old boy. He was a hometown, a, a, a townie, you know, so they like to hear these stories. And you know, uh, that speaks to two, the tale of two city, uh, parts of, the tale of two Bostons, which is, you know, black Boston and then, you know, white Boston, right? Which is some of what this story on the globe is revealing. The, two separate Bostons, uh, the tale of two cities. Uh, but also in that too, let's look at where we're in two newspaper town. What's the difference between the Globe and the Herald? The Herald, I would submit, this is my own opinion, my little anecdotal kind of opinion. The Herald is the paper of Archie Bunker, right? And a hard working, you know, blue collar guy. Hey man, what are we talking about? It's that guy. Now, the Globe is more the paper of Mumsy. Mom's here, someone's on Nantucket, mom's here. Right? The Kennedys and all that, right? So I think that, and, uh, and all, obviously those are huge, huge generalizations and, and both read each other and whatnot. And, and where there is unity in, in, in the two different uh, audiences, there's great unity in the comments. <laughs> you find that unity in the comment section. That's when you find out how much those two readers are actually alike, right? Um, so I, I think that here in a city like Boston, our job in media is to not only highlight um, some of the good things that are happening and the positive things, to also challenge uh, the narrative. And because I am free and clear of the bounds, which I don't have a boss, right, or anything like that, I am able to attack things in a way that other people would not. So my, my, my take on things is a little bit uh, more irreverent. Uh, I get to enjoy the benefits of using, uh, you know, a little bit, I'm a little bit more swaggy, if you will, right? I get to use hip hop and all this type of thing of a, of a, of a new generation. And I'm not a young kid, I'm 47 years old, right? But being a part of the hip hop generation as well, and being able to incorporate the other uses of media and understanding social media, and Facebook, and Twitter, and YouTube, and blah, 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 and being able to put it all together to once again tell this story that is not a journalism story. It's a story of movement. The movement, I call it the struggle. Right? The struggle is something you don't enjoy. The movement, right? And the movement signifies moving, right? So that's where we're at with it. Uh, and the use of, of social media as well. Uh, the problem now is that everybody's an expert. Everybody's an expert. So it diminishes our overall, what should be the first thing. We should get away from personality, we should get away from affiliation, we should be primarily concerned with quality of information. I do not care what you look like, I do not care where you come from, I do not care how you sound, I care if the information that you are presenting is correct or not, right? And if we stick to that script, we'll be good. Uh, the way we were portrayed in the media, we touched on a little bit about that with, you know, the, the, the names and, and the, the codes that are used. Um, even more than that, which was touched on before, is this whole thing of leaders, right? So how does the Globe and the Herald as editors get to pick who our leaders are? And as journalistic entities, there should be some sort of thing where they have to research. So what makes you a leader? You're a leader, you can snap your fingers and get how many people to the Boston College. Because a lot of these people who claim to be leaders, are, uh, I'll say, because it was mentioned before, uh, Eugene Rivers. Eugene Rivers has been, throughout, I don't know, for the past several decades, been listed as either a prominent, a prominent reverend or a prominent minister, a prominent preacher in Boston. You're talking about a man that has less than like ten people in his church, and then I'm not, you, I'm not using that as a, as a, as a, like a, a diss or a joke on them. It's just a fact, right? And even if you have, go to the other school, you got a church as large as Jubilee Church, which is one of the largest churches in Boston, several thousand members. That preacher can't get his several thousand members to agree on nothing. I can make a case that you're not even a leader in your own church because you can't get no agreement. And if you got a couple of reverends in the room, 
You won't get no agreement on them even about the stuff that they say they believe, let alone the community issue. We can't even, you know, determine is Jesus white, is Christmas, you know, his birthday is, you know what I mean? We can't even determine that stuff that's within the faith, let alone get basic agreement on what's outside happening in the community. Violence and policing and health disparities, right? We can't get that type of agreement. So why is it that these media entities get to pick our quote-unquote leaders? Why do those leaders always tend to be clergy, quote-unquote, when more people don't go to church than do, right? Uh, more people is in the nightclub than is in the churches. So why aren't our leaders nightclub promoters? Right? So we have to look at that. And what I would say is that I've done the math. They do it because it's an advantage to them. They don't want to prop up strong leadership. That, that doesn't help undermine the community, which is the, the ultimate goal. We want to undermine, destabilize, you know, keep uh, down, disenfranchise. So if you look at, even if this happens in government, but the media particularly, they're not trying to show you no strong images of you. It's not helpful to their agenda, right? So that's why they promote that set of leadership, all right? But we need to demand, what does that mean? You say somebody's prominent, what does that mean? And then when we look at the leaders, I'll give you an example lately. Uh, this whole debate about Yawkey, as you brought up, this whole debate about Yawkey. Um, and then who's defending it? Black leaders. Darnell Williams from the Urban League, uh, and uh, Reverend Ray Hammond, who's on the board of the Yuckie Foundation. Surprise. So what he's supposed to say, right? Both of whom receive money from the Yuckie Foundation. But that's leadership. Now, journalists should say, hmm, conflict of interest anyone? That would be the journalistic thing to do, that you would look at who's giving these quotes and look at their association and what could be their motivating factor for saying something that the whole rest of the world has already determined is a crock of crap. But yet you're defending it like Tom Yawkey is Abraham Lincoln. So, okay, example of the leadership thing. Uh, and then uh, the other point on the leadership, and I'm going to end there, and this is where the frivolous thing comes in. Those people who choose to create me. Oftentimes, we focus on the frivolous subjects. Uh, Y'all remember the popular game that came out, Trivial Pursuit? And the little slogan was, in the pursuit of trivia? That's what we're dealing with as a society, particularly in our culture. Because now, there are, this is an actual number, y'all, 1.8.2 million websites, <laughs> websites that are talking about Cardi B's album. Y'all know who Cardi B is? Rapper, you know, whatever. So you have an abundance of websites that are discussing all the latest and greatest in hip-hop music right now. You have uh, 100,000 websites that are talking about do you use Indian number five or which, which, which weave do you get? We got uh, what, nails, makeup, uh, food. I like the food ones. Uh, food, uh, cooking, all this type of stuff so that when we choose to create media, some of the last things that we create are news, talk, and political stuff or cultural stuff. We go the route of entertainment, sports, party, shake your booty. That's where we go. And gossip, reality TV, Real Housewives of Boston, right? That's what ends up happening and we continue to recycle the same type of salacious stuff that is part and parcel of our oppression, the dumbing down of America. Have y'all heard the thing that if America got a cold, black America got a pneumonia? So if regular America has been dumbed down, what has happened to the black community that is, okay, so if their children are not educated, what happens to our children who were intentionally not intended to be educated? Because if, if Billy Smith is dumb, and it was a plot and a plan to make Tyrone Johnson not informed, we have to look at that. How does that translate into what we're talking about? So um, I think that in our media and in our, what we are creating, I think that a lot of us are doing the frivolous things. We're creating this entertainment, sports stuff. Not enough of the stuff that moves your brain cells. And then also, too, you know, uh, why is that? You know, why are there uh, not so many fresh bakeries anymore? Because people ain't buying fresh bread like that. 
So the reason is more entertainment stuff is because that's what people are consuming more. They're more interested. If I went live right now and said, ooh, somebody got slapped in the parking lot, we get 100,000 views. They'd rather see the violence, the drama, the ratchetness, the gossip, than the things that are good for them. And that's something that we have to work on and turn out. And I think that is part and parcel of the job of anybody who is engaged in media. Let us use media as a tool to uplift, to get out of oppression, not continue to oppress ourselves, not ridicule each other, not down each other, not continue to show the world our behind, but let's show and put our best foot forward. So that is my goal for black media. It is a promotion of black excellence and a tool to, to, to promote black cultural awareness and, and, and social justice and racial justice. That's my spiel.
it wasn't a conversation that many people had. You know, my historical uh, uh, references were, were people that had lived you know, years and years ago. Most recent of them being like Oprah, Oprah Winfrey. And then talking to my friends, it was our our politics was so wrapped in a Southern Baptist uh, uh, church pastoral respectability uh, type of, of, of mantra or form of engagement. Most of the time, every time we talked about activism, we couldn't get past a conversation about saying nigga or pulling your pants up. So we can't even talk about the economic disparities or the, the ills of capitalism or, or uh, police brutality, because we had to get to those conversations first, which to me was a waste of time. So I'm there and didn't have, didn't have that outlet that I needed. Didn't, you know, I had my, my friends who was, who was all with it. We knew what was up, but you know, where's that space to cultivate that? So I made the decision that I wanted to go to, to Boston. I've been to Boston. I visited it. And, you know, I, I liked it. There was a lot of things going on. Plus, it's an opportunity to, to get real activism. And I came up here. I came up here, got involved in a couple of groups, tested out a couple of them. Some of them didn't make a lot of sense. Some of them were harmful. Uh, and then I ended up landing on BLM uh, and, and Black Lives Matter. And my, my step into Black Lives Matter was just as... As, as as impactful for me as actually being a part of it because I, I had to learn about what intersectionality meant. Not through being in a Black Lives Matter meeting with somebody teaching me and saying this is this is this, but by having a black female friends who are also activists and them just talking through their experiences and then having to lean into the historical references of what uh, Kimberly Crenshaw has been out there in terms of what intersectionality is and having a friend of mine who, who was a guy who was a you know, uh, gender studies major. So if I had stupid questions, I could go to him rather than having to burden you know, my black female friends with whatever nonsense was on my mind. But I, I got had that progression, stepping into Black Lives Matter and, and learning about uh, what it means to be intersectional, what it means to be you know, black you know, and male and, and having certain you know, social economic status and having a, a level of ability physically do things and, and being able to speak well and all these things, things that never occurred to me before. So as I'm moving into this, there are opportunities to go and, and talk to people. There's, I'm seeing what social media looks like as it pertains to activism. And I'm also seeing the, the harms and the ills that happen with that. I'm seeing people who are my friends become targeted uh, through social media when, when people find out that you're activists these white supremacist groups will, will get your information and they will mail, even hate mail through, uh, through the mail. They'll, they'll call your, your number, phone number. They'll, uh, sometimes they show up. And that's, the, that's what I, I would see. And what I've noticed is that it was particularly prevalent among women, among black women. And I'm like, whoa. Because before, intersectionality was just an ideological understanding for me. It's something that you look at the world differently. But when I realized that, man, people will come at black women different than they'll come at me, that's, that's something that I need to really take into account. And not only that, but really building my understanding of what it, what it meant to be black, and let's say English is not your first language, or black and your nationality is not American, uh, or, or black and queer, or black and trans. Like, what are all these experiences like? And then having to learn that it's not my duty to know how to perfectly articulate their experience, but give them the opportunity to speak for themselves. And if there's anything that is my duty, talk about the things that I can discuss from my experience by way of you know, my black maleness. Learning that. So then I get to uh, an opportunity to go talk to somebody through uh, who's doing a, uh, the, the internet radio that I do, the you know, radio show with. That was like last June. There was a show that was on, they said you want to come on and talk about BLM. So I come on there and talk. The guy who is the, the engineer who runs it all said, hey, you want to have your own show? I'm like, okay, yeah, I, I guess, you know, whatever. <laughs> and I go back to, to the, the team, and then you know, I was on who was free to do it. And that was my foray into, you know, that level of, of black media or, or black talk, black commentary. But I wasn't looking for it. wasn't looking for it. Uh, it, it's it's kind of one of the things where you use if you're 
some uh, activist, if you're kind of a jack of all trades, you do a couple of different things, you're going to end up doing everything. So this is one of those things that, like, all right, nobody else doing it. There's a space for it. So let me do it. So over the course of it, I really had the opportunity to bring people on who, who talk from many positions. Uh, one of them being uh, a woman from New Jersey who had a who has a, a daughter who's trans. Who she knew that her daughter was trans since she was three, and then she talked about what it was like to have the Department of Human Services uh, allege that you are, are uh, neglecting your child or, or uh, putting some level of harm on them uh, because of their transness. Conversation I never had had with anybody before. Or having a conversation with uh, Chastity Bowie, who was a part of the National uh, Justice, I want to say, um, uh, emergency fund for folks who are poor transgender. And talking about all the things that, that folks who are black and trans go through. I think something I, I didn't know about, didn't have a conversation about. Or talking uh, with someone from a queer organization for queer black men who told me that there is no space for black men to be both men and queer at the same time. Things that you know I hear by way of, of reading or, or I watch a video segment online that may be viral. But I, I don't know that for myself. I got to talk to somebody about it to figure it out. And then just having the conversation over and over and over again about these areas of the black community that nobody really discusses. And, and what I found through that is that while we, even within the movement, uh, and many people in BLM, while we are such strong advocates for intersectionality, we don't practice it well. Or we, we, we just don't. We, we, we think. A lot of times, if there's a level of, of marginalization within ourselves, that, that is the piece that needs to be promoted in the world. And not everybody's. And it's just like, well, I, not only do I need to figure, figure out how to tell people about you know, this part of my struggle that's, that's not mainstream, but I have to make sure I make room for everyone else. And that's the learning, and that's the journey, the piece that I have to understand. So when you're doing all this stuff and you're managing different social media accounts or you, you're putting out, pushing out content, when I see something online, uh, I think about, you know, if let's say if I don't repost this, who's going to see it? Who's going to talk about it? Who's going to start a discussion? A lot of times, I don't, I don't have an answer. I don't have anybody else that I can look and see. Well, they're going to say this the way that I feel like it needs to be said. They're going to bring light to this subject. If I'm talking to somebody about, you know, uh, Boston Terrorism Joint Task Force, who's going to write that article? Who's going to tell you about the experience of a black uh, Muslim person who is constantly being surveilled every day? Who's going to do that? You know, nobody that I know. None of these magazines or, or, or uh, these, these television shows or, or radio shows, none of them. Because everybody shares this fear of what happens if, if the police or the state somehow uh, is, is maligned to what you're doing. You know, these stories, even though they're true, even though they're, they're factual, who's going to tell them? Who's going to say something? So I, I, I find myself in a position to where I, I have to have these conversations and bring people into these conversations who can speak to these things. Even not just in media. Sometimes people will see stuff that I've done through media, and they'll say, well, let me put you on this panel. Let me put you on this. this. And I find myself saying that, hey, I know two or three other people who got some more information they can they, can, they know far more than I do. We can do this together. They can do it in my this That's what it's like. That's what true community, that's what true intersectionality looks like. So with this piece, I guess, with, with, with media, uh, I don't particularly look at it as something that I was made for. I just see it as opportunity to give uh, a perspective or lend uh, ideas to people who never have them. Uh, I, I'm not one for wrestling with white people on how to be anti-racist. Like I just, I don't, I don't have time for it. Like living is too hard for many of my people. We can discuss it all day. But I, I cannot devote that type of energy. What I can do is, is help promote and share the experience with people who don't have to, they don't get their voices out there like that. They don't get the opportunities that I get. They don't have the, the voice that, that, I, that I have. So that's what I do. So, you know, there'll be things 
and we post with Black Lives Matter through our pages, through the Facebook, through the, through the, uh, through the Twitter, uh, at Dealing Boston on Twitter, and uh, on Facebook that's under the same handle, or through the Inside Radio app stuff that I do. But it's just an opportunity. I just, it's just a moment in time because I'm not going to be here forever. Uh, so I'm just very gracious and very thankful that you know, I have voices who can hear the stuff that I'm doing, have people who can share the work that I'm doing, and we can move toward freedom together. So thank you. Thank you for both of your unique perspectives on this um, important um, issue. And one of the things that's resonated, I think, between the speakers um, we just heard, I mean, the panelists just heard now, and the keynote speaker that we um, heard earlier this morning, um, Kenny Foster, is this um, important in the relationship between community and activism and ways in which media can facilitate that and hopefully lead to some sort of action. Um, um, some sort of action. Like Tony Foster earlier this morning talked about, she refers to for Harriet as a community rather than a publication. I really like the way she kind of framed that, um, what for Harriet does. And so when you think about these, uh, the importance of community, or I think of the importance of community and the relationship between community, media, and the possibilities for social action, um, I wonder if you all, and even for the rest of the career, can meditate on how does that, how can the media create community, and how can the media also use that community to lead to particular parts of social action? And um, follow up to that is that one of the views I think of, of social media activism that I find is that we can have different black voices that will come up and really challenge some of these respectability politics that, um, that we spoke about earlier, um, that challenge you know, um, sexism, heterosexism, and transphobia within our own community. So, how, how is all this shaping? what you all are doing or what we think that the media should be doing for to lead to community and social action. I know it's a lot. <laughs> we'll start there. All right. Well, you know, uh, so the voice that the media speaks to, every media publication knows their demographic. And let's say you talk about the Boston Globe or, or one of the other large publications, like they, they're not speaking to me. You know, they have a viewership, people probably, what, uh, uh, 23 to 35, or, or some a little bit wider than that, predominantly probably white, male, middle class. So if, if I'm doing something, I'm putting something out there, if I have in a position where I can't put something out there, I think very, uh, I think very sincerely about who, who's going to be reading this and who's this for. You know, and this, I'm not doing nothing for entertainment, because when we get uh, black stories through a, the white lens, that's a lot of times what it ends up being. is something to entertain, something to, to get people's blood pumping a little bit, something about your day that's a little bit different, to give you your, your, your spiel, your day to spill a little bit of violence and, and, and terror. But you can read it on the, the, the magazine, you can read in newspapers, it's never going to jump into your neighborhood. So we just we're other in a way where we're seen as animals to be you know, inspected and, and reported upon. I was reading the other day about I've been reading something about uh, literature on police state and the police violence, and they were talking about incivility uh, and in relation to the broken windows areas of, of social disorder being uh, something that that police need to curtail and contain, and they were talking about incivility particularly. In, in urban ghetto neighborhoods, this is like stuff in the 70s articles, and they were talking about how they sent in people, uh, students, to these neighborhoods to observe. You think this is like the like that woman who worked with gorillas or something? Like she was like, like, like we're animals. It's just it's just a, a strange thing to me. But that's the perspective that is is ultimately spoken to. That of you know white male middle class. So if I'm ever putting something out. Who I'm, my thought is, who am I speaking to and for what reason? So if I'm, you know, in a position where I'm reading something 
happening in Sacramento right now, uh, where the police Stephon Clark being killed recently by the police, you're not going to see that in, in the Boston Globe with that shares the perspective of the people there who are actually doing it. Uh, you're not going to see that. You're going to see a very, uh, uh, very factual, uh, non-biased reporting or something like that. So I think about who, who I'm talking to and for what reason. Uh, I think, you know, the point that you just made so about, you know, observing like uh, like animals uh, is very true. And I think y'all will point that you were making before about the Globe's uh, piece. Uh, what was it called? 60 blocks? 48 60 blocks. 68 blocks. There is some level of uh, a voyeuristic, you know, how does the other side live? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What type of strange foods do they eat? Mm, curious. And I, I've experienced this level of curiosity uh, as a young man when my mother uh, busted her behind to, to, to put on pennies in the jar, worked all the time to uh, send me to better schools. She wanted to send me to the best schools. And like a lot of people, best in her mind meant white. So best equals white, and she sent me to the white schools. And that's where I began my level of consciousness to really, it opened me up to the cruelty of the world at such a young age. In my neighborhood, we lived in the hood, it was dangerous. We were not that vicious, we were playing tag and stuff like that. These kids were vicious, vicious, evil, all right, demented. And I'm talking about real demented, like doing stuff to animals and you know what I mean, like bad stuff. Uh, Satan, cutting themselves, all sorts of stuff that I never saw before. One time, uh, I was black, I cannot play basketball at all. I, I was co-captain of the basketball team. I, I kid you not. Lexington Christian Academy, I kid you not. They appointed me co-captain of the basketball team because they had visions of me dunking in the air and all, you know. He's black, you can do that. Um, they also always wanted me to do break dance exhibitions. Um, but I was popular in school, I thought. Uh, but it wasn't popularity, it was curiosity. Uh, and so the first white family, uh, you know, white young boys wanted me to spend the night over, and I was happy. These are like days of Atari. He had a nice cartridge collection. So we about to party on down. It's Atari, man. I mean, we'll be behind all night. So, you know, sleep over, and you know, we both looking at the clock, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, oh, when's this mother going to tell us to turn out the lights, and you know, all this type of stuff. And you know, the old stereotypes that white families have no discipline in the household, you cuss the mother out, you pick your own stuff around. It was true, they never got bothered. And I'm just, and I'm looking at the clock, man, 10, 10, 30, 11, who 11? You know what I mean? 11, 30? And he was looking at the clock too, so I'm thinking, maybe this mother's gonna come in. You know what happens? The clock struck midnight. I had been waiting, thinking, mom's gonna come in any minute, and I shut it down. You know what he asked me at midnight? Can I see your tail? Right, deep, right, I went deep, real quick, right? Now, I was born in 1971. This is about, mm, I'm gonna say, 83, 84 ish. Uh, yeah, 83, 84 ish, because I'm not really heavily into hip hop yet. No, actually, no, I was back by 84, 85. And, man, here's a young white kid from an affluent, rich family out in Lexington who thought that black people at night grew tails. I know. So, needless to say, after I smacked him, and uh, you know, had to, <laughs> had to leave uh, the next day. Um, you know, these are the types of things. But this is this level of voyeurism and observation. It starts with a very basic curiosity. And how does the other side live? When you say that, how do we use this to, to you know, to create change and create community? I don't believe that media creates community. Media should come from community. That, that way we have community meeting. Um, and this is kind of what the problem is with you know some of the big papers in the city, because I think um, they, they have attempted to create a community, uh, and we're not in it. You know what I mean? So there's a, a thriving, you know how people say there's nothing to do with Boston? Well, it depends on who you are. Because see, if you're either Boston is the playground, if you are a young white male, woo Keg parties! Kendall Square, come out, Newbury Street, let's go. Right? Go pass, go Red Sox. It's a great town. It's also a great town if you're an old white man. Right? Now, if you're anything other than those two, mm, not so much. 
If you're a woman, yeah, I'm a white woman. White women don't get no breaks in this society from this town of media. So if you look down to, you look at all the employment, the diversity and whatnot, they still don't even rock with their own and how people are portraying, right? Look at the society pages, look at all this type of stuff. What is the treatment? So that the community that they've created is a reflection of that same very patriarchal, very Eurocentric, da -da 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 -da. and that is a very dangerous mindset to come from. You know, that's that's you know, that's the mindset of uh, what's their idea of romance? Bark, drag you back to the cave, right? What's their idea of you know uh, uh, negotiation? Uh, shocking on total domination, right? We didn't get President Trump, you know, like out of a hat. This thing happened. Certain people predicted it, right? That it would happen. So this is the type of media that comes out of that community. The community we come from is living under that regime. So our media has to be the communications of, you know, the counter rebellion, right? You you got big you got a big uh, country where people are taking over and they're blasting out through the media. Do not listen to the you know the intruders and all that. And you're up in the in the hills with one little radio. Uh -uh. Message to the revolution. Message to the revolution. Meet us Saturday at seven. That's what we are. That's what we are. And we are being drowned out with pirate radio. And they are jamming ninety four five. You know what I mean? So we have to figure out creative ways to push our ideals of the true community and not this sick model that we have. Yeah, I'm, and just to add to that, a lot of folks, I think sometimes it's, it's within the black community, we don't see the urgency of building our own uh, media because we don't see white people or these mainstream industries as being reflective of the community. It's just, that's just how things are, you know, and white people never present themselves as a part of a community. You know, unless black people have got too much, and it's like, oh, well, we got to make sure to take care of our own. But it's never a public conversation. So with black folks, when we're trying to figure out how and what to do, if we're not looking or seeing them as acting on their own behalf, there's no sense of urgency. That's just the norm. That's just the standard. It's not white. It's just how everything is. So that's, that's something that I feel like I, I've had to, to, to tackle and to deal with. Because, uh, and, and even within the black community, since it's, a lot of black folks in here, let me see, because I, I don't get to talk to black people. There's this many black people in the room. Let me just say something real to y'all real quick. That like, there's a lot of black folks who are fighting to be black in white spaces rather than to be black in black spaces. So when issues happen within black communities, there's not the same level of care because people are working to a level of importance. Like, I want to be black in this space. I'm not worried about it. So when we're worried about coming together, like the narratives of people who are you know, in, in, in the hood or, or, or in places that don't got money, and the narratives of people who went through academia and, and got a little bit come up, come up in, as you say, uh, it's, it's, sometimes it's different. Sometimes I run into that. And sometimes it's hard when you're trying to build something that's reflective of the community and there's different elements who are ready to to, to kind of see when it's when, it's, when they've been integrated, you know. So with Black Lives Matter, that's that's a struggle. That's a struggle as it pertains to media. Is that you know we're trying to project these views, and then you got a couple of groups or segments of folks who say that well we don't want to project that. We want something that's more along the line of assimilation.
black folks in the street was not a thing to do. Uh, then I realized, I think the only reason that black folks in other places understood themselves as sort of greeting each other is because we saw that we weren't being greeted generally, right? So we made sure to greet each other. And up here, they're also like, no, we don't need to do that. Right? So, no, I, I just think it's just a point. If, you, if you're not affirmed by dominant culture, you affirm yourself, right? That's the way I looked at it. But up here, I learned that I don't like all black folks. Now, there's some folks I just don't like.
He's dating a 16-year-old girl. We're not gonna unify. Sorry. And, and, and that's not unity today. That's not unity tomorrow. And that's not unity in 2035. It's not gonna happen. Never. So for me, because I got principles and morals that I'm not willing to concede for this falsehood of this great coming together. Another thing is my journalistic thing makes me want to quantify things. People will say, this is a big problem. Really? How big is it? I need to know. So right here on BC, let's, let's use this as an example. I went to the bathroom. There's a male bathroom and there's a woman bathroom. I think that there should be a trans bathroom on BC campus. Okay? Now, in order to do that, well, we'll see, now you said it. I was being facetious. <laughs> because my point is, in order to do that, we have to say how many trans students are at BC. To me, it's logical. It has nothing to do with sexuality. Like, I don't care about that. But, like, let's say there's three kids here who are trans, and there's a population, I don't know, God knows how many kids can afford to go in. But, <laughs> you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people. And let's say that there's a small population. We've come to a place in America where some of this political correctness Corrected, corrected, correctness. And, uh, you know, uh, this kind of wanting to cater to everybody defies logic where we're, we are now legislating and creating rules based on the very smallest of minorities. Meanwhile, uh, black people, with, you know, now they talk about Boston as a majority minority city, right? We can't get none of what we want, okay? We can't get none of what we want collectively. But these small, talk about this when we talk about separation, but these small little uh, um, affinity groups, if you will, get more attention than the collective of the whole. So black people get no attention, right, and no, no accommodation. But there are segments within that black population that has a better chance of getting an accommodation than the group as a whole. Does that make sense to y'all? All right? So the, what I see is that other groups have been able to use this. Now, let me take it out of the black thing. I'll give you a great example of other things. Um, Chinese people. Um, Asians are like one of the last groups that are socially acceptable to make fun of. Okay? So now, you know, no more black jokes, you know, uh, no more Latino jokes, but everybody got an Asian joke, right? And that is socially acceptable. Right? It's not the level of, you know, ooh, bad that it is with everybody else. But every major city that you go into has a Chinatown. Everywhere you go, urban environment, bustling city, little rural town, got a Chinese restaurant. So that means that Asians are in business every damn where. Have cornered out an economic piece of the pie for themselves in every major city across the country. So what's the problem? And why are we not looking at that model to join with, to link with? To, see, that's to me where other groups who may be uh, smaller in number, suffer from language barriers, all these types of things, blah, 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 blah. But they seem to get it popping. And yet, black people is collectively as a whole, because of our lives are devalued, because black lives don't matter. Right? Because our lives are valued. That means 100,000 of us saying, no, the same thing, we need water. 100,000 people saying, I said, we need water. They count, count like three-fifths of how many do. So that wasn't 100,000 people, that was 10. Or whatever. You see? So our voice, even though collective it is, is big, it's diminished. And some of the little affinity groups out of there get more traction than the group as a whole. focus a little bit on the notion of credibility. So even when, like Javon said, you state the facts in your pieces, do you still receive fake news pushback? And how do you deal with that pushback? And how has it affected your ability to share your news to wider audiences? Um, generally, no, I don't get that. Um, my reputation kind of precedes me in that regard. So generally, I'm pretty well, you know, respected or known to kind of be on point. And People kind of leave me alone. They don't. They don't generally want to uh, debate or all these points. And generally, when I put it out, usually the resource and the source material is there. Click on this link, and I tell people often: Do not believe me. Go look for yourself. Here's the link. 
Go, go see if I'm telling a lie. All right? So uh, that's how I do it. My mother says, oh, Jamal, you just love to be right. Yeah. yeah is that a bad thing? I think that's a good thing. Yeah, we strive to be. I'm not perfect, but I'm sure striving for it. You know what I mean? Um, I want to be as right as possible. I hate being wrong. So that's what I strive to do. In terms of getting the message out, we have a little engine that could, from my little bedroom in, in Roxbury, my little laptop, you know what I mean? My little sweatpants, whatever, 3 o'clock in the morning, tip, 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 tip. For whatever reason, it, you know, it's gone on to the New York Times and the internet, gone around the world, print, television, or what have you. So it's resonating with somebody. One of my problems is oftentimes it resonates more with those outside of the group that I'm, I'm creating it. I want to impress black people. I want to impress people in my community like, yo, that's the joint. I'm rocking with that. But oftentimes, I get more credibility from, well, perfect example. Today, I got invited to BC College. Do you know where I've never lectured at before? Roxbury Community College. And I'm an alumni. And it's right down the street. But for whatever reason, black people don't necessarily value it in the same manner as being recognized at Harvard, MIT, all, these, all this type of stuff. So sometimes credibility is, uh, I get it from outside and not necessarily from the community that I really would like it from. All right, so we, we're actually over time. I want to, yeah. Oh, you have If there are more questions. Oh, yeah. more questions. Because we got started late, so. Okay. Sir. Hi, uh, thank you both. Um, I have a question, uh, Jamal, for what you, to what, to the end that you were just speaking about, by saying um, something very interesting, especially given um, uh, what our keynote this morning spoke, but you said that uh, media shouldn't create community, but should come from community. And uh, in relationship, um, Mark, to what you just said, but also the sort of question of representation, the question of the clergy who usually get cited are clergy, are usually black male clergy. So that's not even who the church is, it's all black women, but they aren't necessarily being quoted and things like that. How do you deal with, um, or how do you sort of see community uh, voices rising from the community? What does that look like uh, online, digitally, uh, in a world where everyone has access? Um, and yet, uh, something else that sort of came up this morning Cardi B uh, is what gets you clicks and what gets you um, your profile raised and all these sort of competing interests for sustaining uh, voices um, online and in the media. How, how are you sort of thinking about those questions and what that looks like? Well, it's hard. Uh, I was having a conversation with someone earlier today where I was talking about for a grassroots organization, whether it be uh, media or otherwise, we are far behind the eight ball when it comes to proficiency digitally. Uh, we just don't have the technology a lot of times to be able to push out content all the time. If you think about just something like as simple as our attention spans and black Twitter, and if something funny can happen on TV, black Twitter got a meme in like two minutes. Like, like it just happened. Like, how did you how did you screenshot this dude tripping over a basketball and put a meme under it in this, that time? So somebody's constantly curating that type of art. So with with activists and organizers, uh, we're so so thin. There's not very many people doing that work. So to be able to respond in a in a viral moment quickly. It's difficult. What we do have, to, uh, at least by way of BLM, what we do have the opportunity to do is when there is something that shows up in print uh, through uh, uh, media, those people, okay, can, you can promote them, you can give them and do work behind the scenes. Uh, so for example, this is, you, you have to create a viral moment. So giving you a little bit of a more broad theory of activism and social change, there are these, these whirlwind moments that happened. Ferguson was one of them. And it happened by way of Twitter. Like people found out about it and then all this, the, the ball just started rolling and people started doing work. But somebody has to find that thing to intentionally a lot of times kind of balloon it into something that will capture people's opinion, uh, attention uh, in various
various ways, and that can become an art. Not necessarily creating that moment, but finding it where it happens and making sure people know about it. So one thing that's happened recently, uh, I'm sure you probably know about them in Brown and Heath, they saw the police officers with the uh, drones flying it over or around. Somebody's seen that and, it's, and, and, and said something, you know, and, and, and now we know about what it is. Uh, but if there's not people promoting or pushing that and saying like, hey, here's this thing that happened, then how do people get access to it? And I think that that's part of you know, my group is finding the folks and, and finding those things and say like, look, look what we found. This is indicative of things that people are going through. Uh, and I would just say that, you know, in terms of what the voices look like, I'm going to go stick to my point about credibility. And I'm also using something that Malcolm X talked about. He talked about one of the things that uh, he always viewed is like in college. So this is a, this is a, a, a hotbed, a bastion of talent, a, a, a breeding ground. So that here you have the people who are studying public policy, health, science, economics. So we need all of y'all young, fresh, brains, all the synapses popping because we need to recruit you as experts. It, it, look, if you go into the army, they figure out, you go through basic training, they figure out, okay, you're not going to be, you know, the, the, the general, but you might be a cook. Maybe you're good with a radio. Maybe you turn the computer. Maybe you're good with a pilot. You're dead out of the shop. Okay, whatever it is. They figure out what you can do, and then they plug you into a place where you can do it. So for us in the media, what I would like to see is more people like Art critics, right? Uh, if you're a cook, lady, you know, then talk about food from a healthy perspective, hopefully. Or whatever it is, if you're if you're a economist, you know, talk about the economy. You know, the, the the point was made before about Neil deGrasse Tyson. Who is our student here who's taking astronomy or, or what have you, what have you? So I'd like to see voices open up for people who are experts. Enough of the YouTube. Uh, pundits and pundits who talking about whatever happened on the news last night and have no knowledge or expertise of the subject. Um, what, do you, what do you think about the role of um, hip hop and um, um, using that as a platform because it's becoming one of the most popular forms of music in the United States and across the country as a way to get the message out? Uh, just really quickly, yeah, I mean, uh, Chuck D famously said, you know, hip-hop is like, you know, CNN for black people or what have you. So, um, yeah, that's true, but it's also like BET for black people, too. So, um, you know, uh, and of course, Chuck D being from one of the most socially conscious, politically conscious, uh, and relevant hip-hop groups of ever. So, a um, little bit of a unfair thing, because the majority of hip-hop is not delivering news. The majority of hip hop is delivering craziness and crap, misogyny, uh, pushing drug sales, usage, violence, you name it. Um, so, so hip hop can be used, but I think that it is those people like the public enemies, the dead presses, some of what the Kendrick Lamars, you know, some, and, and some of these people aren't even conscious. So, so for instance, back in the day, every rapper, every album, you, you have all this stuff, but then you got the one love song. Right? So I don't care if it's Cardi B. If Cardi B is whatever, then she got one conscious song. I don't care. I'd like to hear what her little brain could come up with about her, her little experiences, because I know she's had some. Every woman is out. I know, for instance, I know some man has done a real wrong, so she could certainly do a song about maybe sexual assault or something like that. You see what I mean? So, so something, right, to, to give us something of some substance. That's what I would like to see uh, hip hop used as, once again, another tool to advance this movement, hip hop, journalism, whatever y'all get, ice skating, whatever you got, let's use it as a tool for this movement. I have a question for you, Jamal. Um, I'm sorry. It's okay. What should be done to make sure that people in the community understand, see and understand why it's important that they become involved in standing up for things that will change change the lives of people in the community. I mean, you know, as you go through devastation, you don't see people, you know, by, by and large, you know, with a newspaper, not even, not even with them, you know? 
You don't see them like they should. What can, what can we who are concerned about getting people involved and getting people to step forward and do some work, what can we do? I think the answer varies depending on where, where you are and, and what you have access to. So I guess one example of that is uh, when we work with community, a lot of times we don't consider people who are incarcerated. So part of uh, BLM's, uh, one campaign that we're working on is the Deep in the Water campaign. And it's about the, the water in the Norfolk prison being poisonous. That is led in, 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 uh, in part or mostly by folks who are incarcerated. They, they are people who took up the charge. What we did on the outside was uplift those voices and, and join into that. Uh, because they are the people who are most likely to go through those conditions. So if we're looking uh, at what people should do, I think people have to, we have to listen to people within the community who are already talking about it. It's just like when people talk about Stop the Violence campaign. They talk about it as if black people don't do anything to stop the violence. So, but there are people who are constantly working all the time lots of times, often in churches. So when those voices are, are happening, we, I think it's our duty, if we're not experiencing that particular hardship to uplift it, and then do the same, uh, vice versa, something happens with us, we say the same thing out of, out of within our community. Let me give you the quick example. Recently, the state decided that you know, visitors for people in prison should be severely curtailed. You know, before you could go, you could sign your name, you could go visit the people, so that's changed. What should something, as an example, what should people in the community do <coughs> to try to make sure that the people who are, who are incarcerated are not being unfairly and unjustly separated from uh, some sort of in, interaction with their family? No. And it should it should be uh, presented as a public safety issue because you put these folks through further isolation and then they return to society, if they return to society. Uh, they return to society without human contact, without uh, really knowing how to interact with people properly. And they, they, they're, 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 you know, it's a form of torture. Isolation is a form of torture. You know, if you put somebody in a room by themselves, there are very many negative mental effects to that. Um, and separating from their family, da da da. Uh, the thing that I know from, from the Department of Corrections, they always talk about, oh, well, the, visit, the visitors bring drugs. Um, no, how about 90% of the drugs in jail come from your guards? How about that? That you, you, should, you should put your guards behind plexiglass. That's what you should do, right? So I, I think that there are some unfair assumptions. It's an extra punitive measure to take uh, the families away from these prisoners, further destabilize the community, and, and, and so on and so forth. What can we do, as you know, that people are not walking around in newspapers anymore, da, da, da. what can we do? Everybody has to be recruited and deputized. And when we're talking about the falsehood of black unity, uh, we need to get as many to join in as we can. Wouldn't it be nice, like the, the Bay State Banner has these boxes, right? Let's say, let's say, okay, let's use that concept. Well, let's say if every place that we know where we're at is like a banner box. It's a center of information. So that means that every school that's predominantly black, which is most of them, is a center of information. And what schools used to have newspapers, that's out. They don't teach kids civics anymore, that's out, right? Um, what if every church was used as a distribution center for information? for voting, for all of this type of stuff, so that and even if the school says we're not going to teach civics in there, then like the Black Panthers used to do, let's begin political education classes. And some, see, this is the type of stuff that we could do, and back in the day was done, but see, some of these clergy, our, our leaders, um, they ain't opening up their doors for that. They ain't opening up their doors for that. And you know why? Because it don't make sense, because it don't make dollars, so it don't make sense. There's no grant for that. Right? So we have to figure out a way to recruit everybody, deputize everybody, get everybody on board with this train of spreading the information. Uh, you know, they, they've called it, you know, the drum. Right? Uh, uh, back in those uh, black and white movies, you would hear this in the background. Right? Like, make it stop! Make it stop! Right? That drum, our, 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 our sense of communication, Marvin Gaye talks about, I heard it through the grapevine. We need to revive that type of inter- 
community uh, communication and news network. So my question is, how do we align economically with people who may not be welcoming to us? Because I know with the hair industry, um, which is predominantly owned by the Korean community, there's a code not to sell or allow black people to own percentage in that industry, which is a, a multi, possibly a multi, a billion dollar industry. So how do we, I understand that we have Chinatowns in numerous cities throughout the US and so forth and possibly in other parts of the world, but how do we as black people, being the biggest consumers in the world, how do we align with other groups that may not be welcoming to us because money is power and when you have power you have a voice. A lot of people don't want us to have a voice. Um, so I'll just say real quick, you know, I don't know where you get the information from that there's a code where Koreans do not want to do business with black people. I've heard similar things, but once again, that journalistic thing kicks in. See, I need somebody got to provide me with a document or something that all Koreans have signed that says we don't do business with black people. Until that time, I just can't believe it. So what it is, is about relationship building. And you're going to find some Korean out there, dude out there, man. Mr. Young or, 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 or Shelly Kim or what have you, and they're going to love you up. And you're going to have a great relationship with them because everybody, not, you know, there's some Italians that don't like Irish, there's Irish that don't like this. So you're going to find jerks in every group, right? That is, that is the one thing that is universal, jerkism, right? But what you can do, right, and we got it ourselves. That sister said she didn't even find out that she didn't like black people that she came up here, right? So, so it happens amongst ourselves, and it's natural, and it's human, and it's okay. You ain't got to like everybody. But what we need to do is find our common threads because you'll be surprised. There is that Italian lady that'll give you the recipe to the secret sauce. There is that Korean dude that'll uh, put you on to the, to the hair business. You know, and so on and so forth. But we have to build these bridges. And to use another example of the Panthers, uh, back in the 60s and whatnot, if you remember how many Panthers were bouncing and leaving and going to Red China and all this type of stuff. Going and bouncing to Paris and whatnot, making international connections, not just the revolutionary stuff that was going around in the world, but then also, too, if we look now, what has happened now, who's the number one investor in Africa? China. Well, we missed that boat. We missed that boat. And not for nothing, if we look at our history, Africa, China, two ancient civilizations. We've been getting them down for millennia. You got some jade? I got some frankincense. You know, we've been trading for millennia. So the only thing that happened to throw a monkey wrench into that thing is uh, transatlantic slavery and the, the rise of the European white man that sought to break all those communications down. And if the black community linked up with the Latino community, linked up with the Asian community, we would take over everything, legal and illegal, overnight. And if you look at it, lastly, on the point of the media, right here in Boston, we have the largest Chinese uh, English newspaper in the country, right, in Chinatown. Uh, while we have the Banner and WYLD as the, yo, the Haitian community got three and four things. The Latino community got three and four things. Big TV stations, big newspapers. So I think that what we should do is devote a lot of our time to making a lot of cross-cultural uh, uh, connections and networking and making it meaningful and not just talking to it and bringing some, some, some ducats with you too, bring some money, economics to the table. Yeah, I think we can do that like within, so within the black communities there's a whole bunch of ethnicities, but when we think about crossing in, uh, cultures, we don't think about how to do that within ourselves. We, should, we think about doing it, well, let me go over here and talk to this person in this group over here. I, look, I didn't know even about uh, Black Dominican folks, and so I come up here, and a lot of them don't know about Black Dominican folks too, because that's a weird thing that I don't know nothing about. Uh, but this, this is something that we can build understandings amongst ourselves. Uh, I think that a lot of times in Black community, we've been so beat down by white supremacy that we don't know how to look within the community to to provide resources. And I think we need to find better ways to do that. So I mean, African Americans working with, with Haitian folks, African Americans working with Nigerian folks, African Americans who know that Africa has got over 50 countries in it. That's, that we need to do that, just basic education, so that we can know how to work within our own groups, instead of really succumbing to a lot of the stereotypes that the white supremacy, this white nationalism has given us. So one more question? 
Hello? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, on, chime in on a couple of things you guys brought up. One about the idea of unity. Um, I don't think it's an extreme. I kind of think I look at it in the context of um, an ideal. It's a reciprocal force. It's, we're looking for a more perfect unity. So I don't think it's a true or false. It's a kind of a goal or an ideal. Uh, the other point I wanted to touch on was when you said, uh, Mr. Crawford, about um, not focusing on titles and affiliations. I agree totally. Um, the scientific usage that they use is the distinction between um, status and value. Um, people, for whatever reason, in the media might get in because they want to be known as a doctor or known as an important person versus bringing value. The example I typically use is the difference between, it's a negative analogy, between um, cocaine and crack. Cocaine was the high-grade, um, popular drug used amongst um, affluent people, but crack was cheaper and a more potent product and it had a more transformative process. So the media focuses more on, specifically the black media, focuses more on value as opposed to status. They might have a more of a transformative effect. The other thing I want to touch on was um, you were talking about um, in this era we live in where um, sound bites and Kim Kardashian's bra size or Cardi B is more important. It's the age old idea of beauty versus goodness. The masses will always choose beauty, sens sensual pleasure over goodness. That's why fart noises and fist bites will viral and not cry not. So you have to find your way to that. And then the other thing um, Mr. Crawford brought up was the idea that he's trying to produce a product, something very beautiful and admirable that his community doesn't necessarily embrace. And I use the example of Tupac Shakur, arguably the greatest rapper of all time in terms of body and lyric. But who was the person that discovered Tupac Shakur? Wasn't a black person, was a liberal Jewish lady. So that, that and, and then it brings you kind of wrap it up with this idea of um, the, the talented tenth. You, you have to accept to some degree that if you're in that kind of small remnant, 5, 10, 15 percent that's enlightened or awakened, it's a, um, kind of a bitter street. You didn't want to use the struggle or movement, and that's what you have to kind of be cognizant of. I'm dealing with it now as an emerging writer. All the kind of resistance I'm getting, I wanted to stand up and scream hallelujah when you mentioned Reverend Rivers. I was like, oh my goodness, this is, you know, I've never seen a bigger farce in my life. I thought, when I presented myself to him, I thought he was a pillar of the community, and I was just, so uh, that's just all I wanted to share. Oh, I, I did want to, want to say that uh, the, the media, you got to be careful with the, these big media conglomerates. For one, Boston is a, a major metropolitan city mega source for a lot of things. When BLM first uh, got rolling, you know, the, the, the Globe and the, and the, and the, um, so, and the, 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 the Herald, they would come through the email almost all the time. One on the quote, <laughs> you know? And then they, after a while, uh, when I started to see more of it in meeting position where I could, could deal with this, you know, we're, we're entertainment. They don't, don't care about what we said. They know we're going make the, the paper sell. And so whenever something real comes up, like, you know, deep in the water, I'm talking about the Norfolk prison issue, you know, they know where to be found. Nowhere. So when the media, uh, they will anoint you, pick you up and throw you down. All in the, in the same swipe because that's entertainment for white people. I think that that's something that I really, I saw, you know, you, you prepare for, you read about it, all the things that going to throw and all, all the things they do to black people. When you see it, uh, I mean, I don't, you know, I, I, I was like, man, this is, this is real. Like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's scary. Like, I don't, I don't know for you, Jamal, like, when, you, when did you, like, see media, how they move, and how they'll, they'll like, manipulate and take that? Uh, when I got called a demagogue and an outsider by Reverend Eugene Rivers in the Boston Globe, uh, uh, and he called me a demagogue and an outsider. Uh, he was on the corner of Crawford and Humboldt. I could have been on my front porch and hit him in the head with a rock because I live on the next street over on Roofman where I'm being called an outsider. Uh, subsequently after that, the media in the Boston Herald, Peter Gilzenis, uh, wrote an article in which he put out my quote-unquote criminal record, um, and which he got wrong, by the way, it's 
to, I should, had I known at the time, I should have sued him because that other lady who sued him, she got like three hundred thousand dollars. Oh my God, one of my great foibles. And funny story, because I didn't know about suing people in the. I literally found out, like I figured with the statute of limitations, it takes like three years. I literally found out one month after the. I was like, my, this is just the story of my life. I could have sued Peter Gills and the Herald. Uh, put my criminal record out, they put it out, reported it incorrectly and whatnot. Subsequently, um, sometime later, I was shot at my home, I believe, which was orchestrated by powers that be. Uh, after that, there were several stories that was put out. Uh, they had a, the police put out a wanted poster for, for me uh, with my face. Uh, it was real stuff. So, um, so that's when I realized what I consider to be the trifecta between uh, the powers that be in terms of government, electeds, and so on and so forth the police and the media in this town, how they all uh, uh, work together. And uh, part of that narrative is as much as they will shape it and shake it down however they want. Yes, they will pick you up to smack you down later um, and whatnot. But I mean, if we even look at it, what's the dude who just um, who just died? The Catholic priest dude? Um, Bernard Law? So still, Law was still lauded you know, in death until um, the dude from the Globe, I think, wrote the piece and was like, oh, wait a minute, what are we, we're celebrating a, a person who passed this thing off? So, you know, it's like, uh, what does that say? He, he who owns the press? You know, they get to tell their own story and their own narrative, and yeah, as long as you're sexy or entertaining or cute or whatever, then you're all good, you're a media darling. And once that ceases to be, you will be discarded like so much rubbish. And then two, if you show up again 10 years later on Skid Row, they like a picture of that too. Look, here he is now. Uh, darling of the BLM, now he's on uh, Melia Cass making the change. So uh, they, they take great glee in the upswing and in the downswing. From your group, if you remember, uh, Don Asian Yancey, at one point, they, they put her on the cover of, uh, I think it was Boston Magazine or something, right? And then subsequently she got in some problems with and that they love it. They love it. We'll catch you on the upswing and we'll report you on the downswing. You know, so uh, that is deep. But I, I've realized it for a, a, a long time. And this city plays super duper hardball. I end on this. You know, people say it's a big city. This is a big, but it's not. There are 680,000 people in the city of Boston. That's less than the borough of Brooklyn, y'all. Okay? So this is a little uh, podunk little town. Um, it, it is very uh, fond of itself. But this is a little penny ante, little puritanical, little, you know, radio station down at Sundown Town. Okay? Y'all you, you got a black radio station in Arkansas that got to be off the air at Sundown? No, no, not that, no. Right. That, we had that up here for the longest, and that was all, that was our whole shebang. And this is how silly this place is. The video now, the young man who got harassed by the police, last I checked a couple days ago, has now been viewed over four million times. This incident of this young man harassed by the Boston police has now been viewed over four million times. What I just say, the population of Boston is what, 680,000? So it has been seen by five more times than the people who live in the doggone city. Right? So this is, this is a way that media can be used as a tool to expose these things outside of this little podunk, little petri dish that we live in that thinks it is the epicenter of the universe. Right, so um, <laughs> I want to thank everyone uh, for
was sitting well with me and I just let that pass. Uh, I apologize for my queer community for not saying something earlier because I know that's a really important part for our community as a queer person that this is part and parcel to being whole as a black person and this is part of our community and we are part of the community. So being able to have a space where you can go to the bathroom is really important. And I just want to put that out there and I apologize to my queer black community for not saying that earlier. But thank you all for being here and I appreciate it.